Hey everybody, welcome to Online Worship with Trinity. My name is Zach Gates. I'm the new director of Next Steps for Church Online. Uh, I want to welcome you and uh, just encourage you to join me in prayer as we begin our time in online worship today. So uh, if you'll please join me in a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this time, for this virtual space and opportunity to be able to worship you uh, together, uh, individually as well at our homes. And Lord, I just want to uh, thank you again for the ability to do so, to worship you freely and joyfully uh, in the circumstances that we are in. Um, Lord, I want to uh, ask that you open our hearts and our minds to uh, be taken on this journey throughout worship today as we sing and as we listen to your word, uh, just to be open to what it is you have to say and to the way that you're moving among us. Lord, we're very grateful. We want to thank you again. Uh, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Oh 
So before we continue in our worship, I wanted to let you know about a few things happening here at Trinity. April is a busy month for Trinity between Holy Week and having a lot happening at our sites to help prepare us for uh, the celebration of Easter. And one of those ways is called Journey to Easter. It's happening at all of our Trinity sites on Palm Sunday. It's, uh, Journey to Easter is this awesome way to get any of your friends, family members, neighbors to walk through different stages and stations that highlight elements of the Easter story. So please consider joining us or inviting others to join us for Journey to each Easter as we're approaching Easter in the next few weeks. Uh, you can do this by registering via the Church Center app. Church Center app is a great resource for you to connect with Trinity. You can fill out a connect card there, a prayer request, or to find out more just about what's going on. If you're new, uh, we'd love for you to check in and uh, just get to know more about what's happening here. Register for events like Journey, Journey to Easter, et cetera. So uh, managing your giving there can be done too. Uh, and there's also a few opportunities to give uh, that we'd like to make you aware of. First, uh, we're continuing a collection and offering to support uh, those affected by the war in Ukraine. So far, we've raised over $13,500, which is amazing. This giving is gonna continue to the end of the month. So if you're interested in contributing to the effort, you can give via the Church Center app as well. Throughout the Lenten season, we're partnering with an organization called Phil's Friends. Phil's Friends is an organization that provides encouragement to those going through cancer treatments by providing a variety of giving and serving opportunities. So uh, take a look at this video to find out more. Hi, it's Phil from Phil's Friends. A week after I was diagnosed with cancer, I received a care package. Everyone signed their names to it. This simple act of kindness from a group of people that didn't know me caused me to break down and cry. This gift was the reminder I needed that God loves me. In Psalm 136, the phrase, His love endures forever, is repeated 26 times. It's important to know God loves us, and we need to hear it over and over again. Yet sometimes, it's so easy to focus on our problems, and the more we do, the bigger they appear. When someone is sick, they often need extra reminders that God loves them. That's why at Phil's Friends, we send care packages. I received this package in the mail. Here's the box. Package of hope. And she got this whole bag of stuff. And I got this whole bag of goodies. I liked all the stuff. I had little notes, puzzle book, little pillow, toothbrush. It said she was anonymously requested by someone she knows I wonder, I don't know to receive a Phil's Friends care package. And then all these people I don't know. help make stuff and put it together. And it made her really happy this today. I love everything, especially the handmade stuff, especially the blanket. It was beautiful. Everything was nice. Every person, I love the Bible. Every person that had a part in this, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Reaching out to others in a time of need reminds the recipient to focus on God and not on their circumstances. Who do you know with cancer? Is it a neighbor, a coworker, friend, or family member? Request a care package for someone you know with cancer anywhere across the United States at philsfriends.org. Cancer is strong, but hope is stronger. If you or your small group are looking for an opportunity to serve, this is a great opportunity to do so. And we are gathering a monetary donation for Phil's Friends on Palm Sunday. So uh, I'd like to encourage you to prayerfully consider giving and serving uh, to Phil's Friends in that regard as well. So not only do we partner with organizations like Phil's Friends and supporting those affected in Ukraine, but we do want you to consider uh, your giving and support of Trinity's mission for our regular mission partners throughout the world, as well as our lo uh, local mission here in the Chicagoland area. So uh, thank you for your continued generosity. Uh, and I just want to continue to encourage you to prayerfully consider continuing giving or beginning your giving to Trinity to help support us and our mission. Um, but those are the announcements that I have for you today. Uh, let's take a look at our scripture reading for our worship. The reading for today comes from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 10. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. 
He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkeys, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the young boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Well, allow me to add my word of welcome to you all as we are actually coming to the end of Abraham's journey, at least in terms of this sermon series that we've been uh, walking our way through. We have indeed been studying our way through the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, this book of origins and beginnings. And what we saw as we moved through Genesis chapters 1 through 11 is we first and foremost encountered the person who's at the very center of the entire Bible, and that's God himself. We saw how God is indeed an artist, an all-powerful creator who made everything that we see and everything that we don't see out of his uh, love, and he made it with beauty and order and design and goodness. And we also saw how we as human beings in our rebellion, we broke that relationship with him. And as a result, everything else kind of fell apart. And, and Genesis 1 to 11 was showing how there was this downward spiral of our rebellion. And yet God didn't give up on us. He continued to pursue us as his people. And then several weeks ago, we, we saw that there was this major turning point in the book of Genesis as we looked at the story of Abraham where we see God, is his desire is to restore relationship between himself and, and all of humanity, but he starts here with this one family and he tells Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so over these past several weeks, as we've looked at Abraham's life, what we've been seeing is what does it look like to walk with the almighty creator of the universe? What does it mean to trust him and to walk with him as he seeks to reestablish that relationship and redeem all things? And we've seen that, honestly, that journey is a pretty messy journey, that uh, in many ways, Abraham's own faults endanger that relationship. We saw how his fears and his doubts and his plans got in the way and in some cases almost endangered the entire enterprise. And yet God in his love and his faithfulness continued to walk with Abraham, to pursue him, to forgive him, to call him back into participation with himself. 
And last weekend, we've seen that those lessons are being learned. Yes, they're stumbling. Yes, they're furtive. Yes, there's starts and stops. But we saw how God welcomed Abraham into a deeper relationship with him, calling Abraham his friend, inviting him into his plans and purposes and, and sharing his heart with Abraham. And that brings us to this passage, Genesis 22, this story that in many ways is the climax of Abraham's journey. And, and before we dive into it and take a closer look at it, there's an important question that I think we need to ask, and I'm specifically directing this to those who are Christians in the room. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself the question, why do you follow Jesus? I mean, if someone were to ask you, why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow God? What would your answer be? I think there's a lot of different ways that people could answer that question, and how we answer that question matters immensely. Do we follow Jesus simply because we wanna have that secure spot in heaven? Do we follow Jesus because we think that somehow being a Christian is gonna make life easier? Those aren't bad answers, but maybe they're not the most important answer. And what I mean by that is it's really a, a question like that that is at the heart of this story. Why does Abraham follow God? Why does he walk with Yahweh? And what we're gonna see is that here in this passage, God asks that question by offering Abraham a test. By, and, and when we talk about test, when the Bible talks about test, what it means is that we're, we're testing the integrity of something, or in this case of someone. What is their quality? What's at their core? What are the reasons why Abraham is walking with God? And so as we look at Genesis 22, I do want us to look at that test together. And we really need to wrestle with three aspects of it. The first is we need to look at the horror of the test. Then we have to look at the necessity of the test and finally look at the fulfillment of the test. So if you've got your Bibles or you've got your scripture journals with you, let's go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 22 together and let's take a look at what it has to say there. Here's what we read in the opening verses. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. See, the first thing that we encounter in just these opening verses is the horror of the test. What we see is that this is a test initiated by God. Previously, we saw the ways in which Abraham had fallen short, how he let his fears and his doubts and his plans get in the way of God's purposes for him. But here now, God is the one laying it all on the line by laying out this test, by asking Abraham to take the child that was promised to him and now offer him back to God as a sacrifice. And we know that this is a difficult test for Abraham to answer. Many people have looked at the story and said, wow, it seems like Abraham just doesn't care. He just does whatever God tells him and, and offers up his son Isaac to be sacrificed. But, but honestly, if a closer reading of the text shows that, that the author of the text and that God himself is aware of the emotional turmoil that this has caused Abraham. In fact, three times in the passage, in verses 2, 12, and 16, God puts it explicitly, your son, your own only son, at one point saying, your son, your only son, whom you love. God is aware that Abraham's heart, his hopes and his dreams, his deepest love rests on his son, Isaac. Isaac is precious to him. We know that Isaac isn't Abraham's only son. We've learned about Ishmael before, but he's the child of promise the one that Abraham and Sarah have been looking forward to, the, the child of their own flesh, the one in whom all their hopes were wrapped up. In fact, it was God himself who said that it would be Isaac, this child through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And, and you can just feel the emotional weight and turmoil that Abraham has experienced in those words, your son, your only son, whom you love the child of promise, the one that you've been looking for, the one that you've placed all your dreams upon, he's the one that you need to offer back to me now. And you can just imagine as a parent how painful and difficult that must have been. To think that the child that they were waiting for is now the one being put at risk. And that gets us to the other horror of this test, and that's that God is absolutely justified in asking for this. 
I know that's really hard for us to understand in our modern culture today, but in ancient times, the gods could demand a portion of anything that they'd given to their people. So if it was a god of, of the fields and the god of grain, you would offer the first fruits of the grain back to that god. And if it was the god of, of your crops and of your house uh, and of your livestock, you'd offer the very best of those animals back to God in sacrifice. And, and here now, what we find is that the god who gave life to Abraham and to Sarah, and now to their son Isaac is asking for that life back. God, at least according to ancient Near Eastern standards, is asking for something that he's justified in asking for. But it's a little bit different when it comes to the Bible. This is kind of what sets the Bible apart from many of the other religions back in that time and in that day. Many of the other religions, uh, child sacrifice was actually a normal thing. But what we find as you go through the Old Testament is that actually God prohibits that kind of sacrifice. So why is he asking for it here? Why is he asking for it now? Well, the answer is because the heir of a family was responsible for that family. The one who inherited, who was called the firstborn son, even if they weren't uh, biologically the firstborn, if they were the firstborn in the sense of inheriting their father's property and inheriting the responsibility of caring for their tribe and their people, was the one who ultimately answered for their failings and their shortcomings. In fact, it's later on in the Torah, as God is laying down his law, he actually tells the people, the firstborn is, belongs to me. And that you have to offer the firstborn's life back to me or you have to redeem it in some way by a sacrifice. And the reason why is not because God is demanding child sacrifice per se, but because we all stand under a debt that we owe to God. And that's the debt of sin. We saw how back in Genesis chapter three, we as human beings rebelled against our God. We saw through Genesis one through 11, the ways in which we continue to turn our backs against God. And God in his justice says, someone needs to answer for that and it will be the heir. It will be the firstborn, the one who stands in the place of their family, who is owed back to me. And Abraham, as painful and as difficult as it is to hear that, knows it to be true. He knows that God is asking for what is owed, that God in his justice is demanding that someone pay for it. And so Abraham goes, but that doesn't lessen the horror of what's being asked for, the pain and the difficulty of saying yes to God. And, and you just have to imagine that the question that's in Abraham's heart is this one, how can God demand what is owed while also fulfilling what is promised? How can God demand what is owed while also fulfilling what he's promised? Because God has also said that it would be through Isaac that all the families of the earth will be blessed, that ultimately God wants to bring grace, not justice. He wants to bring forgiveness and new life, not judgment. But here now he's asking for that very thing. How can he on the one hand fulfill his promise while asking for what is owed? That's the dilemma that's here. That's the horror of the test. And that moves us then to the necessity of the test, why it's so important that God tests Abraham in this way. You see, God has made some amazing promises to Abraham ever since we first met him in chapter 12. He's promised Abraham a family, he's promised him land, he's promised him a nation. And the question that has to be asked is, are those promises, those blessings, are they the only reason that Abraham is following God? Are they the only reason that Abraham is going where God has called him to do is because he knows that there's something in it for him? You see, you have to wrestle with that question because it's very, very tempting to simply follow God for the sake of God's blessings. And it's easy to follow God when it's all sunshine and rainbows, but when push comes to shove, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we following God for God's sake and for his purposes, or are we simply following him for our own? And this is an important question because if it's through Abraham that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, how can he be the father of faith if his faith is in the wrong thing? How can he be the father of faith if his faith is in the wrong thing? Because the moment he has the blessing, it could be very easy to then compromise and abandon God's purposes and God's ways. And so in many ways, that's at the heart of this test. It's centering around that question that has been posed before and now has to be repeated. We know that Abraham failed this test once in Genesis 16 when he tried to get a child by his own means through Ishmael. 
And God has said, no, that's not the way that I'm gonna do this. And it ultimately provided him with Isaac. But the question remains, what's really at the core of Abraham's being? Is it a desire for God and God's ways? Or is it simply a desire for God's stuff and God's blessings? Will he be faithful when the road becomes hard? Will he follow God when it becomes difficult? And that's a question that I think we have to ask ourselves. Are, are we willing to lay everything down to follow God? That's why I opened this sermon by asking the question, why do you follow Jesus? Why are you a Christian? Is it simply because you think you're gonna get something out of it? Is it simply because you think it's gonna make life easier? Do you think it's because by following Jesus, you're gonna have your best life now as yes, some so-called Christian authors have even titled their books? You see, if we're in it for the blessings and not for God himself, the danger is, is that we will ultimately compromise our calling the moment we think we've gotten what our heart truly desires. That's why this test is so important. Does Abraham ultimately desire God and God's purposes more than himself and his own ends? That's why the test is so necessary. When it comes to doing the right thing, will he cave when the right becomes hard? Will he abandon his faith when the road becomes difficult? And that brings us ultimately to the fulfillment of the test because the answer is, because the question we have to ask is how is Abraham possibly able to respond? How is it that he can trust that God can fulfill promises even while demanding what is owed? How is it that Abraham is willing to lay all the blessings on the line for the sake of obeying God and going where he leads? And the answer is, is because Abraham has faith. He has faith. Not faith in himself, but actually faith in God. And we get two indications of this actually in the story. He knows that somehow God is able to simultaneously demand what is owed while fulfilling what is promised. The two indications we get of this are actually in verse five and verse eight. I want you to listen to this for a moment. It says that Abraham said to his young men, his servants, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and will come again to you. And then a little bit later on, as they're walking toward the place of sacrifice, Isaac himself asks a question. He says, behold, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. These two indications show that actually Abraham believes that somehow, miraculously, God is able to demand what is owed but also deliver on what is promised. We don't know how he knows this, but he has some sort of confidence within him that God is going to restore the promise in some way. He makes it very clear to the servants, the boy and I are gonna come back. He makes it very clear to Isaac, he says, God is going to provide for the sacrifice, provide for himself the, the, the sacrifice that has to be offered. And in fact, it's many, many years later in another part of scripture when we get to Hebrews 11 that actually the writer of Hebrews says that this is the kind of faith Abraham had. He believed that God was able to return Isaac even from the dead. How does Abraham know this? Well, he knows this because of what he's seen from God thus far. He's seen how God called him and his wife this poor elderly couple, unable to have children of their own and brought them to the promised land. How in the face of famine and fear, how in the face of uh, loneliness and doubt, how in the face of their own failings, God has been faithful. He's delivered them and he's provided for them. He's seen how God is, yes, a God of justice, but also a, good, a God who desires mercy, a God who gives grace a God who invites us into his counsel and into his presence, a God who makes a covenant with us, but then puts all the terms for fulfilling the covenant on his own shoulders. God, Abraham has already seen God do the impossible. And so he believes in some way that God is gonna fulfill the promise, even if everything else to the contrary doesn't seem to match up. Why? Because God has done it before and he knows God will be able to do it again. And so he goes, and sure enough, 
what ends up happening? That as they set up the altar, as he readies the sacrifice, it says that the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, seeing as you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Sure enough, God is able to demand what is owed, but also to deliver what is promised. He fulfills what is owed by providing a sacrifice in Isaac's place. Later on in the law, he likewise provides an offering. He says, you can offer up a sacrifice instead of your firstborn. That's ultimately what I desire. God is a God who's willing to pay the price. The one who just as he walked through the covenant ceremony alone to show that he would fulfill it here now, he provides what is required so that his promises might continue to move forward. It's a beautiful testimony to who our God ultimately is. He's a God who provides for what is owed because we can't possibly pay it. The price is too high. It's, it's something that none of us could possibly fulfill. And yet God in his love provides exactly what is required. In fact, this is something that we find as we get into the New Testament because it's a question that continues not just through the rest of the book of Genesis, but throughout the Hebrew Bible. The question is, how is it that God is going to demand what is owed by his justice and yet fulfill what he's promised by his grace? Throughout the scriptures, the question comes up over and over and over and over again until Jesus arrives on the scene, the true descendant of Abraham. And it actually says in John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That when we look at the story of Jesus' life, where we ultimately find it ending on Good Friday, we see the son, this time carrying the wood of the sacrifice on his back in the form of a cross, carrying it up his own mountain, and in that moment, the son becomes the lamb. He lays down his life for his people so that we might live truly on the mountain of the Lord. It shall be provided. In fact, I love how uh, the writer of Romans, the apostle Paul puts it, he says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. The reason we follow God is because he is the only one worthy of following. Because he is the God of heaven and earth. He is the one who sustains our very universe, but he's also the one who speaks to our hearts. The one who alone is defined as love. The one who out of his grace and his goodness provides what we could never pay for and promises to walk with us through every difficulty and circumstance. No, the road doesn't automatically get easier. No, suddenly the tests don't become more simple. But yet through all of it, God promises that he will be the one who will provide. He will be the one who will lead. He will be the one who will pour out grace and forgiveness even in the moments when we ourselves fail. And we can know that because he's the God of the impossible. Because he's the one who offers himself up as the sacrifice. Because he's the one who three days later rose again from the dead and promises us that as difficult as the road is now, eternity is our ultimate destiny. We look forward to what God will provide. We look forward to the day when he will make all things new and that's why we walk with him. That's how we are able to like Abraham have true faith by being able to say to God what God once said to Abraham, I know that you truly love me because you have not withheld your son, your only son whom you love from me. We too are called children of Abraham. We too are called to follow God to sometimes places unknown 
by paths yet untrod, to face trials and difficulties which on our own we would never be able to bear. And yet God's promise to us is that he will be with us through it, that he is the one who can and will fulfill his promises, that he is the one who can and will provide for what we lack, that he is the one who gives us grace, mercy, and forgiveness and will carry us forward until the day that he makes all things new. That's what it means to have faith is to trust him, to trust him because we've seen his love, to trust him because we know that he can provide to trust him because yes, he has made all things and yet calls us his own. And so whatever it is you are facing, whatever challenge, difficulty, or test is laid before you, know that God would never call you to it unless he was willing to walk with you through it. For he is the one who made us, who walks with us, who died for us, who rose again, and who will one day call us to himself on the day that he makes all things new. And so it's with that in mind, I'd like to pray. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks that you are the God of Abraham. That when we couldn't possibly pay what we owe you, you laid down your life for us. That you gave your son, your only son whom you will love in our place that we might live. And so Lord, I pray that we would rest in that knowledge that even as we walk through difficult paths and difficult circumstances, we would know that you are the one who carry us, that you are the God in whom both justice and mercy meet, that it's on the cross that all things are made new, where you declare it is finished. And you call us simply to rest in your grace. Lord, may that be our hope. May that be the source of our faith and our trust that we, like Abraham, may learn to walk with you however imperfectly we do it, knowing that you are the God who ultimately will provide. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Let's take a moment to reflect on the message we've received and on the song that we just sang. Let's use this time to confess, to worship, or to meditate on God's word. And after this short time of reflection, I'll begin to say the Lord's Prayer, and I would love for you to join me in saying that prayer as well. So if you'll please join me in this time of quiet reflection. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. As you leave worship today, I wanted to send you away with this blessing. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious upon you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you for joining us today and have a great week.